Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Our guest today, Shar and Teddy, go all over the world healing the sick in Jesus's name. And they're going to show you how to also. Shar and Teddy, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having us. It is an honor to be here today. I want you to tell me how you grew up. Did you grow up in a household of faith at all? Let's start with you, Shar. No, I didn't grow up in a household um, that believed in God. Well, everybody in America is a Christian, of course. So it wasn't like I was really raised in a Christian or a religious background. I went to church in, on Easter. Like most people, I only came to God in my early 20s through a dream that I had. I was in my second year in uh, college. This dream troubled me for a while. And I went into this computer place, this library, and there was a gentleman there. And he interpreted my dream for me. And uh, the, the dream actually was I was outside. It was chaos everywhere. And I was holding up a Bible. And I was saying, I was holding the Bible saying, we need to get right. We need to get right. It was fires everywhere. It was just a mess. Uh, kind of like what you would see on, on TV. And so uh, the next scene, I was in this car and I was going over this Vodok like hill and the earth had opened up that we didn't know. It. Somebody else was driving a car and my cousin was driving a car and the car crashed into the lava. A black screen came on and said died in 1914. Now this was like in 2001. So the, the gentleman that interpreted the dream said that somebody else is steering your life. You know, you're being steered by others and it's going to lead you to the pit of hell. And so when he interpreted that dream, I gave my life to God right then and there. I knew I couldn't be involved in that. And so from that standpoint, that's when I became a born again believer. So did you ever find out what the year 1914 meant for you? No, I did look up what 1914 meant. Um, but no, I don't, I don't know exactly what died in 1914. It could have been, it, it could have meant I would have passed in 2014, which we're in 2023 now. I'm here, thank God. So um, I'm not really sure, but 1914 uh, definitely um, still is with me. Okay. And Teddy, how about you? Did you grow up in a household of faith or were you just void of any kind of religiosity? Pretty much grew up in a household of faith. Um, my family started off as Catholic um, because they were from Mexico. And so you grow up as Catholic. But then my mother, when she remarried, um, we became Baptists naturally. And we went to a lot of Baptist churches. And uh, as a matter of fact, Nat King Cole's father was my pastor at one point in time. I met Natalie Cole, you know, back then in those days. And so that was the Baptist church. And then as I got older, I went to the Episcopalian church because I, you know, I had the Catholic roots. I wanted to find God. I studied world religions for a while, which took me on a world of tour of religions. So then I became, um, I found a good apostolic based church and I started going there. And I spent over 15 years as an apostolic. And then I switched to Christianity for a small period of, not Christianity, but Catholicism, because I really wanted to understand Catholicism better. And then after that, we've been searching for a good church home ever since. But my roots now, I would say I'm more apostolic Pentecostal, because that is where I learn the most. Um, being a Catholic, you don't learn a lot. You're just giving a lot of instructions. Episcopalian, lots of instructions. But um, the apostolic church grounded me very well. So I know you mentioned to me earlier how you went from church denomination to church denomination to church denomination. Were you looking? Is that why you kept going yes. from denomination to you were hungry for? What were you hungry for? You're trying to find Jesus. You know, you know, there's something better out there. You're going to church every week and you're just not being fed the way you want to be fed. And that spirit inside of you isn't, isn't being fed. And so you keep going. And, and like I said, once I got into what they would call a tongue talking church where people are filled with the Holy Spirit and profess it. Now, if you're in a Catholic church, you don't profess those things. 
you're in an apostolic church, you're going to stand up and tell the world, I am saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost and running for my life. And that's, you know, and you start feeling like you're at home in that environment. So, and, you know, the Pentecostal church is called Catholic and apostolic, and the other churches, dead cold churches, because they don't really worship or worship in the spirit like most Pentecostals. So once mm. I got there, I felt more at home. And I feel like there's a lot of people right now watching who are in the same situation that you were in, and they're still searching and yes. they're like, I want more, I want more. So we're praying that by the time this interview is over, that they'll have a good answer to where they need to be. So let's talk about how you met. You two are married. And the way you met is almost like a supernatural kind of thing. So, Shar, could you start? How did you see Teddy? Because you saw him before you even met him, you say. Yes, it goes back to when God says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb, right? So we've had a life prior to this. We just don't remember, clearly. So we were, I was in grad school in my last year. And um, I went into this class and it was actually the first day. It was Dr. Bruce class. I'm not sure what type of class it was, but it was a class where we write a lot of papers. I do remember that. And so when we uh, were doing, I guess, introductions and I I saw, I saw him around before the school, but I, you know, I didn't, you know, I just some, you know, older gentleman, I didn't think anything of it. So when um, he spoke, I said, oh, my goodness, inside of myself, that's him. That's him. That's the man that I'm supposed to marry. And I, I didn't even, I, it's, just, it's just crazy how I, I knew when I heard his voice, his voice was like calm and waters. He, um, I kept asking, like I was persistent. And there were other women interested in him, which I didn't know because that didn't matter to me because I put my bid in and my bid was accepted. And uh, we went out to Denny's for the first time. And from there, um, he said that he thought I was a nice person. And we just started hanging out. But I do want to say this. Um, I felt like it would have been a sin not to marry him. Now, that's strong to say. It would have been a sin. This is prior to our experience that we're going to share. But I felt so strongly it would have been a sin. And it would have been. And I won't ruin it for the audience. But once they get into the story, you, they'll see how it would have been a grave sin uh, for me and missed out on rewards, heavenly rewards, everything, if we didn't get together. Teddy, how did you see her? Because you saw Char before you saw her. Explain that. I had seen, she had on a, like a brownish color blouse at one time with a, something on her head. And I had seen that, but it was in a certain image coming toward me. And one day she was walking toward me and looked exactly like the vision I had. And so over time, you know, we just became good friends. You know, she is more outgoing than I am. She likes to talk a lot. So and she, like she said, she saw me at school. I would be there two to three hours early, just sitting there studying. I, I never looked around. I just sat there and studied because, again, school is kind of tough sometimes. But once we got together, God just told me, you have to take care of her. And so once I had that, then everything from there was solidified. You know, and then if we look back now, we look at every step because we try to figure how would we be right here today if we hadn't met at that point, if she hadn't been so persistent. I had already finished grad school and my next school said, you can't start this semester And I had to go back to that school. And I said, well, I'll just go to grad school again. So here I am in the going for the second time. And then we meet. Had I not gone back to that particular school, we wouldn't have met. So God aligned it all. He knew exactly where I was going to be. He knew where she was going to be. We met, we came together and she was searching for the Lord. I'm searching for the Lord. And then we had events that came up and if you look at all the things we've done, and the one thing I wanted in life was a travel partner. And since we've been together, we have literally been around the world. So, and she's bolder than I am. So no matter where we are, she will jump out and start, you know, praying for people, healing people, regardless. And I'm a little more conservative, but she does it. 
and it works. And so without us meeting, none of this would have happened because we would not have had come together. And then like when the, the group that we're with called the Elijah Challenge, she wrote to them and got with them. And so like she said earlier, we went to Houston to meet up with them. And that started us on this trajectory that we're on now. And it's been a blessing ever since. There, there's no missteps. God never makes a mistake. Amen. No, he doesn't. So I'm glad you mentioned the Elijah challenge because after you two got married, I'm assuming you joined the (laughs) Elijah challenge. What is the Elijah challenge for those who don't know? So the Elijah challenge is an organization that's based out of Houston, Texas. The founders are William and Lucille Lau. I found them looking over the internet for, I was just tired of not being able to have power like the the disciples did. And I was complaining to God, like, God, why can't we heal the sick? Like, why can't we do these things? And I was like talking God, stalking God and trying to figure out why. And so um, what happened was um, I told him about the life of challenge. I said, look, they healing people all over the world. They casting out demons, they raising the dead. We have to go to their gala. They have an annual gala every year. I said, we have to go. I booked our tickets. And we went and we met them. And when we met them, uh, it was just amazing. William, I was like, you're like Elijah's, like Jesus' brother, you know, because I had never met an old, like an old time Testament person, like prophet, he's not a prophet, but I never met somebody that did the miracles like that. And I mean, raising folks from the dead, he trains people. I've been on mission trips with them as well in Sri Lanka, but the Elijah challenge is amazing. We had another ministry called Eternity's Tour. And basically we were going to get um, people that had life and death experiences, near death experiences, where they died and went to hell or heaven and came back. But then I realized that the Elijah Challenge to Healing the Sick is needed. And so we decided to be Elijah Challenge, Illinois or Chicago at the time. We originally are from Chicago and now we live in central Illinois. And so now we're the Elijah Challenge. Um, Illinois. And so it's so rewarding working with the Elijah Challenge. And we still work with them. We still um, train with them. We um, started hosting, after I went there, we started hosting events around the country. So we did events in Las Vegas, in in, uh, Texas, uh, Atlanta, Atlanta, Chicago. Chicago. We were hitting all the big cities. And so we did this a few years back and we are going to return to go to other big cities. And so the Elijah Challenge, they really go overseas a lot because the miracles are greater there. Miracles do happen here, but it's, it's a bit different here, but they do happen. There's a reason for that. And remember, we talked about the Nicolaitan spirit. When you go to a person, an American, and you say, can can I pray for you? They're like, sure, but they have no expectations because my pastor normally prays for me, but the pastor prays to God. In the Elijah challenge, we rebuke the infirmity that the person has, just like Jesus did, just like the disciples did. And we see miracles happening just like that. There's nothing wrong with prayer, but Jesus never prayed for anyone. He rebuked the infirmity. That is what you learn in the Elijah challenge. You learn that you have power, and that you have authority, and you learn how to use that power and authority. And once you learn how to do it, you become more empowered. And that's where it came from. We've had people actually say, can we pray for you? Oh, I'm kind of tired right now. How can you be too tired for prayer? And then when people do allow us to pray, and they get healed, they look at themselves like, what happened? How did you do that? We say, I didn't do it. Holy Spirit did. So we normally tell them, The kingdom of God is near, which means you were only healed by the kingdom of God. We gave the command and the kingdom did the work. That's what we do. Amen. And I'm actually really glad that you mentioned that because prior, I asked you the question, is it easier to heal people through Jesus in countries or even areas where they don't know God rather than those who it's a heavily Christian area? And you said, absolutely, it is harder to heal people in Christian areas or Christian, I guess, communities 
more than it is in non-Christian. Why do you say that? Well, I remember what Paul said. You know, he did not want to go and preach where somebody has already preached because now he's got to unpreach all the wrong stuff and then bring in the right stuff. So what has happened over the history of the church is layers. In the beginning, there was God and there was man. There were no layers. God said, Adam, what are you doing today? I'm just walking around, God. And then all of a sudden, we have to build layers. We have to have a pastor. We have to have a pope. We have to have cardinals. We have to have all these things in between us and God to the point where I no longer talk to God. I have to talk to my deacon who talks to the assistant pastor, who talks to the associate pastor, who talks to the pastor. And maybe he goes to the cardinal and he goes to the pope. And then maybe God listens. So again, we break down all the barriers. We just go straight to God. That is how it was intended because that's how God set it up in the beginning. Man just get, get, gets in the way. So do the both of you think that there's been too much indoctrinization in America where there's the so much world. denomination where so many people have been indoctrinized with so many different denominations and belief systems where it kind of overshadows the truth. Yes. And think of it like this. How many gods are there? True gods. Just one. How many churches are there? We can't even count. So you get the idea that every church thinks they're the right one. How can that be if there's only one God? And that's because man wants to be the one where, you know, Satan wanted to be just like God. All these little churches think that they're the only ones God is listening to. I remember people telling us in my church at one time said, we're the only ones going to heaven. The rest of the world is not. You know, that's what they told us. And so those are kind of, you get that in your head and you start believing it. But once you study more, you realize, no, especially when you start in the book of Romans, where Paul brought in the Gentiles with the Jews. And he said, no, it's for all of us, not just you and you and you, but everybody has it. So, you know, we read the scriptures, we study the scriptures, and we learn. And the scripture clearly states, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But now, take out the word truth and put in Jesus, and you will know Jesus, and Jesus will make you free. And so we've learned who Jesus is. We've learned how he said, I will come written in the volume of the book. We read his word. We eat his flesh. We digest that word. And therefore, we grow. And then also, I would like to add that tradition. Tradition is jamming us. Yes. We follow it because my grandma or um, Pastor Jenkins, you know, did it for 30 years, did it this way or that way. And if we look back in the Bible, everything repeats itself. Every single thing repeats, right? So we're in 2023. It's things repeating all the way back from the Old Testament. So one thing that's repeating, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were the same thing with the churches. Nothing is new. Mm -hmm. When Jesus was here and disciples, they did not have clergy. They did not have all of these things in the way. And so we must return home. We must go back to where Jesus, how Jesus did things. We have to follow that outline. We have a template, but we must follow it. We cannot follow man. Don't follow me. Don't follow Gabe, Teddy. Follow God. And the Elijah challenge is about that. No, you hear from God yourself. No, don't rely on me because I'm a woman and I will fail you. I'm going to let you know right now, I'm going to fail you. So you have to seek and learn uh, different techniques, different methods. Everything is like school. Learn how to heal the sick is training. Everything could be du duplicated. So it's not something that you have to figure out on your own. This is available. And if you're not careful, you will get tricked. Like so many other people have been tricked out, uh, out of a lot of things in this life. And a lot of people, unfortunately, good people are in hell. Uh, Christians are in hell. But you have to do everything in your power to fight and find out the truth and hear from God yourself. There was one more thing I was going to add. The Elijah Challenge was birthed because William got saved in 1977-78. And the Lord told him to go to Borneo, way out in the jungle, and preach the gospel. And he had never finished reading the Bible, but the Lord inspired him to go. He packed up his life. 
and they went to Borneo. When they got there, they had no place to stay. They didn't know anybody. But the Lord, if you look at their history, the Lord provided for them a home. He provided a boat. He provided. He stayed there for eight years. And one time somebody asked him to pray, and he was reading the Bible, and he did it just like the disciples did, and the lady was healed. So what he did is he read the entire Bible. He extrapolated all the things out and only left in what the disciples did. And he said, we will be like the disciples. We will pray like them. We will heal the sick like them. So the Elijah challenge is only an extrapolation of our Bible, the 66 books, but it's telling us to be more like the disciples. Jesus said, make disciples of men, not Christians of men. But what do we do at church? We try to make Christians of men, not disciples. There's a difference between a Christian and a disciple. So, but that's where it came from. It was birthed through him eight years in the jungle and setting up churches. And to this day, children that started with him 30 years ago are pastors of churches today. And I would like to mention, they wrote a book yeah. and the book is turning into a, 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 a series, series yeah. not a movie, but a series with, uh, I think, nine or 10 episodes. So when it comes out, everybody, that you have to check it out. This is true. And they go into demon possession, miracles. I mean, everything is true that you are going to see on the screen. What's the name of the show? Well, it's in the early stages now. Yeah. Um, but the name of the book is called Dancing on the Edge. Yes, on Dancing on the Edge of the Earth. And right now it's in production. It's not in production, but funding. And mm -hmm. they have ran across some obstacles. They're working with a Christian film company, but there's been some obstacles. And um, they're in the process. I'm not sure at this very moment where they are, but every week when we talk with them, we get an update on where the um, show is. Yeah. Good, good, good. And I mm -hmm. have two questions for the both of you. Um, mm -hmm. Two things that I wanted to get at. Before, and then we're going to get into the healing and all that in a minute, but prior to your healing ministry and prior to the Elijah challenge, have any of you seen supernatural healings before the Elijah challenge? Because I know yeah. there was a hunger for it, but had you ever seen it before? Yes, I can give you an example. I was at a revival and this is a well-known pastor. She travels around an evangelist and she was saying to the people, you know, she was telling them, in the name of Jesus, I bind the powers of darkness. I command healing right now in Jesus' name. And people were jumping and they were getting healed. And I said, come on, that can't be true. So I grabbed my hand because my back was really sore. I put my hand on my back and I said, I bind the powers of darkness. I command healing right now in the name of Jesus. And I was healed. So what do you think the first thing I said? I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And it happened to me. That's just how miraculous it was. I had never seen a healing like that. So that day, and this was back around 87, 88, that's when I realized people do get healed, but it's just by the power of God. And was the pastor saying it? No, I said it. So then I realized there's something in me. I still didn't know what it was, but I knew there was something there that could cause healing and just commanding it. For me, it actually happened to me, myself. Um, I didn't know anything about rebuking or commanding. But um, in my earlier 20s, you know, you're young and you don't make good choices. I had contracted HPV. And we know that there is no cure for that. I made a deal with God. And I said, God, if you take this from me, I, I, I won't engage in, in, in premarital sex. I was true to my promise. I lived clean. I maybe had one slip up out of seven years. I'm going to be honest. You know, we want to be honest. And uh, after that, you know, I didn't do anything. And when I got married, I went to the woman doctor to check out everything. And it was gone. Praise God. Completely. Oh. Yes. So uh, if you make deals with God, I'm just saying to the audience, if, if you're going to do that, make sure, because it's better not to make deals with them if you're going to. You don't do that. It's better not to make deals. If you know, you know, not that you're in a desperate situation, but I didn't know healing was available. I didn't know anything, but I made a deal with God and he completely healed me. So uh, just be careful with that if you decide to make a deal with God. 
Yeah, that's biblical. biblical. And so, Shar, I want to get back to you on something you said prior. Some people may not understand. I understand what you're saying, but some people may not. When you mentioned that there are Christians in hell, explain what you mean by that. Well, a lot of people follow their pastor. They follow and they're afraid and they just stay in the church. It, Jesus, when he was here, they did not stay in no church. They were the walking church. They were the mobile church. And so um, a lot of Christians, a lot of them really don't know the, the true Jesus. They think they do, but they don't. And so a lot of Christians think, oh, because I serve in the children's ministry, I'm on the auxiliary board, you know, I'm, I'm in a choir, I'm serving God, I'm serving the body of Christ, but Jesus was not on the auxiliary board. He was not watching kids in the children's ministry. He was out there in these streets. And that's where we, we need to be. But again, a lot of uh, Christians that are in hell lifestyle, they didn't take it serious. They didn't do everything that they could to serve God because a lot of people aren't aware that there's heavenly rewards that we're in the running for. So salvation is something different and rewards are different. And a lot of, I know a lot of people probably are not aware of that. So rewards could include mansions. Um, you're in charge over galaxies, over cities, just like talents with that, um, the parable of the talents. He's gonna put you over many things since you've been faithful over little things. But salvation, of course, is granted to those who truly um, have turned their life around and is worshiping God with their lifestyles, not just with their mouth. Oh yeah, I love the Lord, but here I am. I'm gonna curse my um, so-and-so out. No, no, that's not, that's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to be like him, learn from him, spending time with him. You become him to stay in him. If we do not stay in him, we do not have anything. And I think about a lot of some of the famous people that have passed away. And I always wonder, what did they do for him? What did they do with their money? What did they do with their influence? What did they do? Because it all means nothing if you don't do it for God, if you don't have God in there. I know so many people that have that had great influence that could have easily pushed the Great Commission, but they were busy with other things. So I think a lot about that because this life is passing away every moment. This world is going to pass away. It's going to be made new. And only what we do for God is going to last. So I hope I answered your question about Christians in hell. I believe you did. So let's go over to the other side of the world. And you're in Sri Lanka and India and all this. You guys are traveling now all over the world, not for leisure, but for mm -hmm. healing. So tell us about your journey. What did you learn? And Give us examples of people that you've healed in Jesus' name. Teddy. Okay, I can give one. We would normally start off with, we start off on a Friday, go to a Saturday, to a Sunday. The first day we get a group of people together and we teach them the Elijah challenge. The Holy Spirit will then come upon you and say, it's time to heal someone. So you'll turn to the group and you'll say, Is, does someone here have an ailment? And that person normally will stand up. So you go to the person and you say, in the name of Jesus, I command complete healing. Now, be completely healed in the story of Jesus' name. And they're healed just like that. That is proof. Because without proof, remember, Jesus was an on-the-job trainer. So we are on-the-job trainers. So we do that on Friday. Saturday, we'll come back and do it again. We teach more. And when we're in another country, we'll go 10 hours a day. Oh, yeah. We'll just Easy. teach for all day. We have a lunch break. But by the end of that day, we then go out and we have what we call a crusade. We'll take all these trained people, we'll preach the gospel, just like the scripture says, and then we have all the newly trained people go up front, and then crowds will just start coming toward them. And when you look at the crowd, you'll be amazed. And look at the eyes of the people healing people. Their eyes would just glow in the dark, because we'd be out in the middle of fields where there were no lights, there was nothing. Can you tell them about it? A country that we went to? Yeah, that was in uh, Devilgar, in, in India, India, northern India. Okay. And we had, you know, generator lights and things like that, but it was just amazing. I'm standing up on the stage and I'm watching these new disciples 
heal people. Everybody that would walk toward them, they would touch them, they would say the word, and they would be healed. It was just amazing to see that. So we start getting energized by watching them, you know, and, and now they're amazed because they never knew. Here they are following Jesus, listening to the scriptures, but they never realized how much power and authority they had. So what do we teach? Power and authority. And when people get healed, again, on the job training. And so it, it's been miraculous. Every time, I can't think of any place we've been where somebody wasn't healed. Even in the United States, we've healed hundreds and thousands of people here, but overseas where they've never seen Jesus or heard, it's even easier because they're worshiping Nanak, Buddha, Lao Tzu, and something like that. And then all of a sudden, they hear about Jesus and they see the miracles. Shar was with this one lady who was a Hindu. She had the dot on her forehead and she was riddled with arthritis. By the time they were done, the lady peeled that dot off and became a Christian. And I'm not bragging about the Christian thing, but she was willing to give up what her family had learned all those years because she was healed right there on that spot. So it, it's miraculous. It works. And so we've been to, well, I've been to um, Sri Lanka. <laughs> he had to work, so I left him. And I got on that 17-hour flight by myself. And um, I met William and Lucille in Sri Lanka. So in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to be, be with them. And I'm going to go through another training. No, they left me at a church. And I had to teach the Elijah challenge. Of course, I rebuked for people. People got healed. Uh, but I was so shocked that they they left me. And uh, that was like um, getting out of the boat when mm -hmm. um, Peter sank. But I, I did not sink. Um, it was amazing. And we went to, um, Teddy and I both went to India and uh, India was amazing. India was spectacular. We went to Assam, the furthest part of India that we went to so far, it was so remote. They had never seen an African-American in person. And they were like, why do you talk like that? You sound American. Well, I am American. I just look like I'm African, but I was born in America. Of course, my family ancestors did come from Africa. So that was interesting. And uh, I want to get into the part where I spoke a miracle on myself. It was a bad miracle, but watch what you say. I was in, during that time, I was, I enrolled myself in a weight loss challenge. And I said, um, before we went out ministering, I said, I want diarrhea. And I said it with so much faith. And so I went to go brush my teeth. And I want to say two minutes later, I had diarrhea. And it, it ruined my day that day. Uh, we, were, we had to go out. You know, we already are dealing with that time difference, which jet lag is a monster. Um, and so I had another issue I had to deal with. And so um, I had to leave him. I had someone to help me, but I had to leave him. And he had to minister to so many people. But what I did was I rebuked whatever it was that was in me. I said, I, in the name of Jesus, come up and come out now in Jesus name. Come up and come out now. I placed my hand on my stomach. I want to say maybe about two, three minutes later, I started vomiting. So whatever it was that got inside of me, it came up and came out. And so that was um, a weird miracle, but um, that happened to myself. And you want to be careful what you say out of your mouth with so much faith. You will get what you say, especially doing this type of work. Our words are powerful. We have charge and command over demons to lead people in sickness. And so uh, be mindful of what you say. Amen. Amen. I agree. But Shar, could you explain to the audience the reason why you prayed for diarrhea? Yes, I wanted to win a weight loss challenge. Did and I win? wanted to. Yes, of course. Yes. Well, we yes. have told her, don't drink the water or you will get oh, diarrhea. I brush my teeth. Right. You know, I'm thinking, okay, I could brush my teeth with the water. And I didn't equate it with that. I wasn't trying to get sick. I mean, I did say I wanted it. But I, I didn't know that brushing my teeth would jam me, and it did. 
And so, yes, I lost, I don't know how much weight I lost, but, uh, and then after that, I didn't want to eat anything. Um, we were there in India as cows walking around, stuff not sanitized. Uh-uh, I don't do that. So like we were eating cliff bars and I mean, cause you just didn't want anything else to jam you because you don't know. And you really don't want to insult people because they want to feed you when you go. Um, but we did eat some stuff and we did pray. So um, it was very interesting, very, very interesting. And I will go back again in a heartbeat. We are going to go back. Yes. Amen. Amen. But I have a question for you. What was your prize? I think it was like a hundred and some dollars. It was money. <laughs> but I guess the biggest prize was the weight loss, I guess. Yes. And the weight loss. Yes. <laughs> so tell us about what is the most memorable time that you prayed for somebody and they were healed i have one quick story his best friend uh, james williams so this was when we were living in the chicagoland area he knew about what we did he attended some of our some of our trainings in person we had a training center at that time and he was having a heart attack and he drove to our house knocked on the door rung the doorbell at two three o'clock in the morning so that we can rebuke for him and we got out of bed and we rebuked that heart attack and it left he never went to the doctor for it never years have passed and still i mean he never went to the doctor and i said james why don't you drive all the way over here because we live by uh o'hare airport and he lived in the south suburbs of chicago why are you driving all this you know this far at this hour because he said i know that this is where I would get healed. That's why I didn't go to the doctor because I know that they cannot do anything for me. And so um, it was amazing. And here's another example. <clears throat> there were two people, the very first time they'd ever come to our training center, a man and his wife and their daughter. And she came because she had a backache. There was something in her back that was really sore. So I had done the training for the hour. And I said, but do you have the Holy Spirit? And he says, yes. I said, well, you can heal your wife. He said, I can. I said, yeah. I said, put your hand on her and tell the pain to go. And he put his hand on her and said, go. And the backache went away. They've been with us ever since. And this is over six years ago. And because he said that made him a believer. So when you see things like that happen right in front of you, and what you, you can all doubt goes away. Something else that's rememberable this year, last year in 2022, um, my grandmother <laughs> and a friend was both diagnosed with cancer the same week. Uh, it was stage four. It wasn't like two, three. It was straight four. I was really upset about that. And so we were rebuking for both of them. So um, was it August 1st, my grandmother was diagnosed with stage four. And then later on in that week, a friend of mine was diagnosed. I'm not sure if hers was stage four. It might have been. I'm not sure. It was maybe four or three. Um, so we were rebuking and we were rebuking for weeks and weeks. So my grandmother went to the hospital and they did a surgery and removed the tumor and they tested it. First, they said they couldn't figure out what it was, but they did diagnose it was cancer. It was stage four. And they said that we got to send it somewhere else to Ohio or something because we don't know what it is. The results come back. She don't have cancer. She didn't get no chemo, no nothing. And then my other friend, same thing. She got some, some items removed, came back, no cancer, no chemo, none of that. Jesus had healed them miraculously. And what I want to say, my grandmother is 90, okay? She's 90 years old. And she got miraculously healed. Now, my grandmother is not a believer either. You know, the other person is a believer. So it's just, you know, you just do with the life challenge, with the healing. You just remember your training, do your job, and God will do the rest. I wanted to add something to that, too. Because if she was a believer, then she would be held to a higher standard. So when somebody is a Christian, you say, I'm a Christian, I go to church every Sunday. So they have to repent first before yes. they can get their healing. The other person did repent for yeah. taking the vaccine. A person out in the world, you, you heal them first, and then they'll believe. But if you're already a believer, 
we have to, you know, we call it deliverance or a prayer of repentance, and then they'll get healed. So got to be careful because people read um, the book of James 5 and they want to use that scripture. But be careful because that's you. You have to go and repent first. So Amen. that's the one thing we've learned over the years that if they're a Christian, then now we have to go back. When did this start? What have you been doing? Is your life, like Char will say, clean? And if you're not living a clean life, you've already told God, God, don't worry about me, you know, because you're not living according to what he told us. So, so there's a difference. So if anybody calls us and says, heal me, then, and they haven't repented, you know, if their pain level is a 10, it'll go to an eight just to prove that it'll move. But to, to get from eight to zero, you've got to do something called repent and ask for forgiveness. And you want to be honest. Yes. You know, honest and come clean. If you got to confess, confess. Yes. And that infirmity will leave, especially for a believer. We've seen this too many times where believers are involved in stuff they shouldn't be involved in. They going blind, but they looking at porn. And matter of fact, speak of that time, because you did tell me that there was a deacon who was yes. going blind. Tell us about that story. Yes, we were in Atlanta uh, hosting an event and the Lord will give me word of knowledge uh, quite often. And so um, he said he was on the Zoom and he said, can you pray for me? And so I'm rebuking, rebuking. And I, you know, we check. We don't just, you know, pray and rebuke and go about our business. No, we check. And he said, no, it's not, nothing's really changed. And the Lord had said in my spirit, ask him, is he watching porn? Now his wife was right there next to me. And I said, excuse me, you know, I, I hate to bring this up, but are you watching porn? And he said, yes. And his wife didn't know nothing about it. He got found out in front of his wife and everything. And so he, um, we did rebuke. Uh, I believe some healing did take did. place. Some relief came. Yes, but yeah. maybe all of it didn't go. Maybe he had some tapes somewhere, you know, that he needed to get rid of or websites. I don't know. He did. He said that he had books and things that she didn't know about. They were hidden. You know, he'd watch it in his own little private study there. But he had to repent. And as he was repenting, his sight was getting better right there on the spot. Now, Teddy, you said just recently that and a lot of people may not understand what you mean by this I understand what you mean but a lot of people are wondering how come if you're praying for a christian they need to repent but if you pray for an unbeliever why don't they have to repent in order well, to be delivered the scripture is very clear on that it, it, it one of the simple ones if you have a not with your brother what do you do leave your gift at the altar but go and repent confess with that brother or the scripture says confess your faults one to another and pray ye one for another and so if we don't do that we're not allowing because that is what god told us to do he commanded us to confess our faults one to another so sometimes in the church people think oh i gotta go talk to the pastor and we have found it's easier or it's easier to talk to god than it is to talk to each other because i have to humble myself to talk to my brother in the church because people look up to you and think you're all holy. And then when you go to them and say, well, you know, I slipped last week. That's hard. So it's a humbling experience. It's easy to go somewhere and say, God, please forgive me. And, and like Jesus would say, but your heart is far from me, you know, but when you confess to a brother or sister, that's very hard to do. And we do see better results when we do that. Sort of staying on the same topic, I've seen many instances where people will go to different countries to do mission work and they would pray for people. But before they would pray for people, they would make them or try to make them convert to Christianity in order to be healed. Question for you, is that necessary? Why or why not? Uh, no, because we must follow what Jesus did. He did the miracles first. He fed the people first when he multiplied the fish and the bread then you minister because the miracles is what that's how you fish them in with because he said i will show you how to be fishermen of men so when you show them that their arthritis is healed and they got all kind of disease that's uncurable they want to come to god they want to serve god and they they will bring their whole family 
on our website, there is a testimony where a lady, she was completely blind and she, uh, a life to challenge worker, this was over in India, had came over and ministered healing in Jesus name. And she was healed and her husband accepted the Lord too. So why wouldn't you want to accept healing or from the God that's real? Because Buddha, whoever, they, they're not coming through with the miracles. You didn't spend all your money on the witch doctor with the chicken and all that stuff. It's still not working. And so people get desperate. And uh, actually over in countries like that, those witch doctors, they're real. And those deities, they're real. I asked some people about it. They manifest in front of them, like Shiba Nim and all that. They're real deities. And um, so people over there will come to God, the true God, once they see that their arthritis is gone. So no, you do not need to, you know, preach the gospel first. No, after they get healed, they want to hear what you got to say because they're not in that pain no more. So that's my response. Yeah. It, it's funny because we see that all the time where um, people will have spent countless dollars on witch doctors. And this is going on today. It's not like this was a thousand years ago. This is happening today. And then somebody from the Elijah Challenge goes and pays a visit and just says, be healed in the name of Jesus. And they're healed. We have a tape of a lady. She had a statue out in front of her home. Her daughter was crippled bad with all types of diseases. The disciples went in. This was just two months ago. They go into her home. The daughter is completely healed. The mom, we have a video, takes the hammer and crushes the statue. Yang kuat tidak apa-apa, Ibu. Kuat, kuat, Ibu. Atas kepala. Oh, 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 this idol in the name of Jesus. This family, this mother and this daughter, we break every power of this darkness in the name of Jesus. Let the, let the peace come and overflow this house right now in the name of Jesus. Let the peace, every, every, everything. Break every soul time. Break every soul time. And everybody standing around watching it because all these gods they had in their front yard couldn't heal the daughter. The name of Jesus healed her. And this is real. On WhatsApp, we were now connected overseas 24 hours a day. And also Zoom, we're connected. So we have meetings with people in different time zones all the time. We'll be up 7 in the morning. It's 11 at night there, but we're still having our meetings. And this is how we can keep up. And then they send us videos to show us what happened. So the proof is there. Jesus is more powerful than all that. It's easy to heal cancer. It's easy to heal arthritis. It's easy to heal all that stuff because we have power and authority and it works. It's unbelievable. I mean, we've been doing this for a while. And, and, and I mean, I'm always sh not shocked, but just it's a treat to to see it and when i have something wrong and i rebuke that's always a treat too not that i want to i remember saying oh i want to make sure you know i'm sick so that i can heal and feel that warmness and tingling no i don't want that but um the rebuke and we do use it for ourselves too and we um stay healthy and healed and the reason we use the term rebuke is because that's what jesus did he would rebuke the infirmity he didn't pray for the infirmity. He rebuked it. So that's where we get that term rebuke. So, But we have to find, if you go to somebody and say, can I rebuke for you? They're going to say, no, get away from me. But if you go to that person and say, can I pray for you? Oh, yes, please. 
And then they hear the words come out of them. I command you to be healed in the name of Jesus. And then they're healed. And I'm like, how did you do that? So. Amen. Amen. And if you try that with a Christian, if you say rebuke, I think they'll get offended. <laughs> so yes. it's good that you say prayer. Now I want to yeah. get at, I know a lot of people I, like, like you, Teddy, I've been in church all my life, but I've noticed that a lot of ministers and evangelists and pastors, any title you want to put on it, a lot of them wait for a feeling, but is that biblical? It's, it's instantaneous. If you are a child of God and you have the Holy Spirit in you, then you're equipped. And you don't have to sit and wait for an anointing or anything like that. You just, like the guy that was in our office, I said, do you have the Holy Spirit? Yes. Touch your wife and tell the pain to go. And he did. It was gone. He didn't have to wait for an anointing. He just issued the command and it happens. So it, people that are going to listen to us, if, they're, if they have the Holy Spirit and they truly believe without doubt, if they have mountain moving faith, that what they say will be done, it will be done for them. All they have to do is issue the command. And does it work every time? No, because we don't know what's going on. But I'd say 80% of the time, it's going to work. You know, because again, if somebody has infirmities that are unconfessed and they, we can't touch that, but the people and God knows who to heal, you know, there's, there's people that need to be healed so that they will turn and come to God. So it happens. And another thing too, if you're out in the street and you're healing one person and then two and then three, before you know it, there's 50. We have had so many people, we couldn't even turn because people were just crowding around us. Please touch me, touch me. And people, it's like, wow, we never believed that many people would turn to Jesus. But literally, we were trying to get to our car. We couldn't even get to the car. This was in India. Yeah. It was people <laughs> carrying sick people to us, you know. Through the fields. They get on their cell phone. Hey, come down here. They healing. They healing. Just come. Just come. And uh, they didn't want us to leave. And it was like when, when Jesus um, uh, was healing the crowds. It's real. It's real. Literally, I, they, William told us, he said, you, you won't even be able to eat your dinner. You go to try to eat and people see you. They come up and they surround you. They want to be healed. And they forget that you're trying to eat. You know? They forget you're trying to relax. They want to be healed. And this is really, it's not <laughs> that we're superstars. No, we're, yeah. we want other people to learn this too. Absolutely. No, no, we're just nameless disciples. I'm, I'm not important. I'm just a messenger. And so- yes the the, the uh, training the rebuking and the commanding it'll be with you and you'll remember your training and I think back to your question uh with the pastors um it's a lack of training I think if they knew this they would do it if you always stick to your training if you are training to handle a weapon you're going to remember your training you have to remember your training in all situations you go back to the training you go back to what Jesus did and then after a while, it's second nature. Well, how do you raise the dead? Same formula how he did it in Dorcas. You don't add nothing new. Don't be speaking in tongues. Don't be doing all that stuff, dancing. Don't do that. Just sing it up. Just do what the format says in the book. And the person will come back to the life. Uh, in some cases, sometimes no. But uh, you still try anyway. Well, you know what? Speaking of pastors, Shar. I know a lot of pastors who don't believe in yeah. healing anymore. They believe that it is done away with it. It ended with the new Testament. Why? And I want to hear from both of you. Why do you two believe that pastors just don't believe? Pride. If, if you walk up to someone and say, God healed this person and they don't get healed. They're going to say, how are you talking to God? Actually, I had a guy do that to me today. Um, I said, I'm praying for you now. And uh, 10 minutes later, he emails me back, your prayers are no good. I said, why don't you just become more patient? And then things worked out for him. But pastors have a lot of pride. And because of that pride, they don't want to pray for you directly because if you don't get healed right away, it'll make them look bad. And then the offerings might go down. So what do they do? If you're in a church and we use Sister Jenkins all the time, she's sick. The pastor will say, everybody stand up. Now, he not just him, but everybody. Let's pray for Sister Jenkins. Lord, help Sister Jenkins. Lord, you know her needs. Lord, you know. And then everybody sits down. Sister Jenkins hasn't moved yet. All right. 
But then they say, well, God will answer it in his time. But did Jesus do that? When Jesus would go into the room, he'd say, be healed now in my name. And the person was healed. If the pastor were to do that and get over that pride, more people would get healed. But again, you got to remember, you're a pastor. Everybody's looking at you. Everybody's expecting your prayers to be, you know, next to God. Because that's what he was taught. And his pastor was taught. And his pastor was taught. They were taught all this stuff. So you don't see a lot of that. A lot of churches, and we try to teach healing in the churches. And, well, oh, we don't do that here. And, you know, we know why. They're afraid. How about you, Shar? Well, I want to say they miss it out on some rewards. So yes. they're going to jam themselves when they get to eternity. And they may make it, you know, to the kingdom. But they might not have a mansion. They might be just living in the park, you know? <laughs> so... Um, but why do you think they don't believe? Well, I think it's it's fear. It's uh, one pastor told me we were going to a church and we were going to host this uh, Elijah challenge there. And I said, um, why not host this? And you know, I'm direct, you know, because I'm just tired of the religion. I'm just tired of, you know, people not being able to kill a bird. Just, just, just sick of it. And so uh, he said, well, because I don't understand it. This is what he told me. And then I said, well, why don't you try to understand it? And he didn't say nothing. You know, after that, I, I didn't go back to the church. It's just the foolishness I have zero tolerance with because you know better. You know, you studied the Bible. You're a pastor. You know, people are looking up to you to lead. And, and we don't need a pastor to lead us. We need Jesus to lead us. He will show you things, tell you things. His language is visions, dreams. He will show you what whatever you ask. He said, if you pray for bread, I'm not going to give you a stone. You can take him up on his word. So mm -hmm. that's the reason why I believe they don't understand it. They don't want to understand it. And maybe because it didn't come from them. Um, It'd it be a lot of petty stuff, um, I believe. And it's unfortunate. And there's a lot of people that teach cessationism where miracles have ceased. How can you say that when people are getting healed every day? You know, and so we, we teach against cessationism. We teach only what the scripture says. You have to believe. And in, in the very first day we say, you have to believe that the, the scriptures are the inspired word of God. And people will say, but a man wrote them. They were inspired by God. And once you believe that and you start believing the word, it starts to manifest inside of you and you grow. But as long as people can convince you that, oh, those went away in the book of Luke, it kind of died out. No, it didn't. The Bible is true forever. It didn't stop with Luke. So. Good answers, guys. Good answers. So how do you teach people how to pray for themselves? Because like you said earlier, you don't have to go to a pastor all the time. How do you teach people how to pray for themselves for healing? Because people are wondering that now, you know, they're one, they're saying, I'm sick right now. I need deliverance. I need healing. I've been sick for so many years. I have all these ailments and I just want to be free. And I've gone to different um, people for healing and nothing happened. How do you teach people to heal themselves through Jesus? Well, the scriptures teach us that nothing will harm us. We can walk on snakes and scorpions. We can tread on them. The easiest challenge for anyone to do right now would be if, if my shoulder is sore, take your hand, put it on your shoulder and say, shoulder, I rebuke all pain. I command the pain to go now in the name of Jesus. Go! And you'll be surprised that they'll be healed. And so that's all we really have to do is just say the word. That's what the scripture told us to do. Just say the word and you'll be healed. And again, now they have to learn how did that work? And so that's when you start coming to the training, the Elijah Challenge training, and we start pulling the scriptures together, showing you where the scripture said, this is why this works. Because again, they've been taught by their pastors and their pastors teach every time, come to me, I'll talk to God for you. Or they're saying, talk to God. God told me, and another good example is when Peter went beneath the water, he said, Peter, why did you doubt? Every time when the disciples couldn't heal somebody, Jesus would rebuke them and say, oh, ye of little faith. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, then you can heal yourself. 
And your best example is you, your wife, your children. And once you start seeing it happen, you'll believe. Now you need the Elijah Challenge training because we've already extrapolated all the scriptures you need to learn. And that's all we teach. And also faith comes by hearing, hearing and hearing, practicing, going outside the classroom and actually doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, for a person, let's say that's watching now and this is new to them. Well, I have issues. Let's say they have issues with their stomach. Okay, you rebuke for it. If you don't feel a change, you do it maybe four or five times. Okay, if it's still an issue, okay, now I need to I need to dig deeper. Am I eating like the devil? You know, am I eating stuff that's causing acid? Am I jamming myself? Am I eating too much candy? And it's a good chance, yes. You know, if you're having bowel issues, and I'm speaking from experience, if you're having bowel issues, well, what you doing? Are you eating too much stuff you shouldn't eat? The answer is more than likely yes. Eliminate your the issues and even ask God to show you in a dream. Right before you go to bed, ask God a question and drift off to sleep. Wait for the vision and look for it. And he's going to show you exactly what you need to do. If you don't get it that night, knock again, do it again every night until you hear from him. He does not mind you stalking him. If that's what you need to do, what well, that's my motto. If I want to know something about anything, I just ask him right before I go to bed tonight. I ask him, can I go here? Can I go there? And he shows me things. You have that same ability to hear from God, to see, because he speaks in dreams. He speaks in dreams to most, most of us. That is his language. And look and see what he is showing you and you will get your answer. A good example of that is you, you lost your keys. You can't find them. You know, you go to bed at night and in a vision, God shows you exactly where they are. You wake up in the morning and it's right there. But how did you do that? God did. He showed you where it is. Or there's something you're looking for. And he just shows you in a dream. You wake up and there it is. And you're like, how did that happen? So it happens to us all the time. We just don't realize it's God doing, doing it for us. And I want to thank you, too, for not taking the credit and not saying we healed. But you always give honor and credit back to Jesus Christ because that's where it came from. Now, you just recently mentioned how to pray for yourself. There, there are people who are watching this channel who are not born again. They're wondering, well, can I do the same thing not being born again? Well, if you're not born again, it's a little tougher because you don't have the Holy Spirit. Jesus left us the comforter. Once you have that comforter, it does get a lot easier. But if you remember this, if we go back to the Garden of Eden, there was Adam, there was Eve, all types of animals. Adam could climb to the highest mountain, jump off, bang his head on the ground and say, whoa, that was fun. He wasn't going to get hurt. After the fall, all pain and suffering entered in. So all pain and suffering is the result of what? Sin. So what are we really rebuking? We're rebuking that sin. We're saying, you, pain, get out. And it will listen to us. It will go. It is the result of sin. But if you tell somebody, well, you have sin in you. No, I don't. I'm a Christian. And that makes it harder to get out. But think about it. The, you know, really digest it. Was there any pain and suffering before sin entered in? The answer is no. So what do we have to do? Rebuke sin and you will be healed. But you have to have that Holy Spirit that does make it a lot easier. And I would say if they're if you're an unbeliever and you're watching, try it yourself. Yes. You know, don't trust us. Do it yourself and see what God is going to do. And of course, there's probably thousands of people that is watching this video and that's going to watch it. Try it yourself. You do. Um, and then think about long term. We're not here forever. You you want to be on the winning side. Uh, Jesus is amazing, cool. You get special abilities. I mean, my goodness, the list goes on. Um, so it, it, it's not a bad walk. It's fun, exciting. Jesus is not religion. He is not uptight. He is so cool and so fun and has an amazing personality and things that you wouldn't think he would do, he's doing. Um, holy, of course, but he's amazing. So um, that would be my advice for the person that's watching now and that doesn't believe you, just give him a shot. You know, he, he loves you and he wants you to be with him. Great answer. Great and answer. And also I'm having a cupcake party at my mansion. 
And I want to invite everybody uh, that is viewing this. It's a black and white cupcake. So you have to wear black and white um, outfits. <laughs> okay. So you mentioned other religions. Here's another question for you. Some people are like, well, there's so many gods out there. Can't we just pray in our God's name and we'll be healed? What is your answer for that? Try it. <laughs> you know, rebuke the Sheba name. See, see, see what that do, you know, Muhammad. Try it and but, see. But the easiest way to do that is open up your Bible. And when God said, thou shall have no other gods before me, it says God, capital G, said thou shall have no other small g gods before me. There's only one God. The rest are demigods or whatever, but they are not God. So good lesson. Capital G is God. And it's kind of, whenever you're reading scripture, when somebody doesn't capitalize G or, or God or Jesus, even when you use God as a pronoun, when you say him, capital H, all right? Always make sure we give reverence to God where he belongs. So tell us about prayer therapy, because you specialize in prayer therapy and you teach prayer therapy. So tell us what is prayer therapy and how do you do it? So prayer therapy is based on uh, Dr. Joseph Murphy. He um, wrote um, this book called Prayer Therapy and the Power of Your Subconscious Mind. Some of your uh, viewers probably have heard of the book before. So he wrote a series of books and this one special book called Prayer Therapy. It is, it is biblical based. And basically the premises is on whatever man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So whatever you speak out of your mouth, that's what's going to be. And prayer therapy teaches you how to pray uh, and hear from God. You actually pray. For an example, there's a technique, there's different techniques, and it's called the thank you prayer. So the thank you prayer would be something like this. I thank you, God, for waking me up today. I thank you, God, for the new job that that is that I have right now. I thank you, God, for amazing help. I thank you, God. So there's no asking. There's no, I didn't ask God for anything. I thanked him for it already. So that's that scripture that said, speak things as they are not, as they will be. Right. I thank you for that, God. And so that is going to manifest in your reality. It's just a matter of time. This meeting, this deep believer, this is a result of a manifestation. I was journaling for 30 days straight. I thank you, God, that we are going to be able to teach people how to heal the sick. I did this for 30 days straight. So when I reached out to you and I got a response back, I was not surprised because I've been, I journaled this 30 days ago. I stopped journaling and things will manifest in your reality. And so um, there's different techniques that you can do to hear from God. Example, the, visualiz the visualization technique. The visualization technique is a technique where you visualize, let's say you've been praying for something. You're, you're praying to be healed. Let's say that you have uh, your legs, something wrong with your legs. So every day you take time to visualize yourself walking to the door, answering the door. And there's a story in, in the text where somebody, they were actually um, paralyzed and they would visualize themselves walking and walking. Well, one day a fire happened. They got up, <laughs> yes, and helped other people out, and they were healed. So their faith, we are powerful. We have the same ability to multiply food. When times are going to come this rough, we don't need the government. We can multiply the water. We can multiply the fish. We can multiply whatever it is that we need. We can do the same thing that Jesus did. When he had the fish, he blessed it. You do the same format. Get some fish, put it in the basket. Bless it, same format, and it's fish in the basket. So in times like that, God will provide. So prayer therapy teaches you how to get close to God. God will meet you. He will speak to you inside of yourself. He will show you dreams. He is with you and in you. And we meet God inside of ourselves. Where do we have visions at? Inside of ourselves. Where do we hear from God? Inside of ourselves. Nothing is external. It's all on the inside. So prayer therapy specializes in manifestation with God, how to hear from God, how to learn more about God, how to pray effectively, and your, your prayers get answered for anything. It could be for a new job. 
It could be for to get pregnant. It, anything your heart desire is available. Great answer. And you're reminding me of when my family and I moved out of state. Right before we moved out of state, we told the members of our church. And one lady walked up to me and asked if I asked the pastor if it was okay. And I told her, absolutely not. God already gave me the confirmation and you can't go higher than that. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that because if God gives you to go ahead, there's no one else to go to. It's a done deal. So I'm really glad that you guys are knowledgeable in this and you walk in it. So I want to move on to the Nicolaitan spirit because you were really pressing on this last I spoke to you, the Nicolaitan spirit and how much God hates it and why if we have it, we need to avoid ourselves from it. I think the most alarming part is when the scripture says, and the Nicolaitan whom Jesus hates, because that, that wakes you up like, what, Jesus hated? So well, it's not a person. It's not a group of people. It is a spirit. And it came from Nicholas. Nicholas was a proselyte. He was a person. He became a Jew because he thought Judaism was the way to go. Then suddenly when Christianity came along, he said, no, 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 I want to be a Christian. So he rose up in the ranks in the church. And then after a while, now you got to remember, this guy is going whichever way the wind blows. So now that he's in the church and he's doing all these things, he goes and says, hey, guys, we don't have to worship like that. We can do whatever we want. We don't have to do that. And so he was going against the church, but he had risen to a high position. And people wanted that. Why? Because itching ears. They wanted him to say, oh, it's okay to be bad sometimes. Oh, it's all right. And so the Nicolaitan spirit is in a lot of churches. And the scriptures, you hear people say, they go where there's itching ears. Some people go listen to or listen to a pastor preach, and they'll say, what did he say? Well, it was good. What was the message? Ah, you know, it was, uh, you know, he was really, they couldn't even tell you because there was no spirit in it. It was chant and recall. And we know what that is. Y'all, ha, and we, ha, and we, ha. You know, and, and it was chant and recall. And what do you learn from that? And I got to tell you this story. There was the guy who came to our church and he was an old Baptist type preacher, you know, with a real deep voice. And he started, oh, yeah. And the people started shouting. And <laughs> For what, right? Said, oh. <laughs> yeah, he hasn't even done anything yet. And then he starts going, home, bread and grits, home, bread and grits, home, bread and grits, ah. And then the people are shouting and screaming. And he said, wait, 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 wait. What are you doing? He said, Pastor, you were preaching. He said, I was sitting cornbread and grits. You guys aren't listening to me. You get the idea. People get caught up in a cadence and they believe it's real preaching. And it's not. But that's where that Nicolaitan church is. Some people go and they play church. It's not real church. Amen. I tell the Holy Spirit, if you want me to run around this church, you pick me up and you make me run. All right. Because I've seen people run. And when they soon they stop and say, what happened? What happened? Man, I had my new shoes on and I wanted everybody to see them. I had to run. And so they're telling, you know, it's but I wanted to hear the Holy Spirit pick me up and made me. That's right. You get the idea. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on because we've been taught how to do it in the church. I hope I answered your question. It's really good. And we find that we mentioned it earlier. We found out in, in Revelation chapter two, verse six, 14 and 15. Yeah, 14 yes. and 15. So if anyone wants to look up the Nicolaitan spirit, it's there. I want to get to something really quickly before we close, because this is something, Shar, you mentioned, even though it's off topic, you mentioned something to me that really uh, pinpointed something. You said, Social media will judge itself. What did you mean by that? So social media, let's say somebody is on Facebook and they writing bad things, nasty things, being mean. Well, they're judging themselves because God is going to bring up that post from 2022, September 22nd. And that post could have affected the person reading it. It could have made them feel a certain type of way. It could have brought the spirit down because of the nastiness and the meanness. And so that that's our subconscious mind is recording everything. It's powerful. And I, I, and I should have mentioned this with prayer therapy. We tap into the subconscious mind and it's, it's powerful. And so uh, 
you somebody could have read that post and got depressed just like this podcast people are going to look at this and they're going to be motivated to seek to get healing to reach out because this is a social media type thing and we can use this for good or bad and a judgment or reward is attached to this here right now january 3rd 2023 so everything that we do is being recorded and so things on Facebook, Instagram, it, it's to me, you know, it's 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 somewhat of a trap uh, for some. And you have to be uh, wise to know that I'm not going to get entangled in that type of stuff and flee from it. So it's it's just another avenue of, of um, sin uh, that could be used as sin. It could be used for good or bad, just like food. Food could be used for good or bad but we choose ultimately how we use it. The one thing is the scripture says, least ye cause my children to fall. So if you put something on social media and it causes someone to fall, you have to pay for that. It's not just pastors, it's all of us. We are responsible for the person next to us. So we have to really step it up. And some of us don't. And, and it's really bad for the, the Nicolaitans. They're the ones that go to church every Sunday, dress the finest, wear the best of everything, and can thump that Bible and quote scriptures, but live like the devil. And people fall because of it. They're going to be held accountable for that. They're going to be knocking on the door, and they're going to say, but didn't I do this in your name? And didn't I do that in your name? And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I have never known you. The scriptures are plain. They're telling us, let's not play around, but we do anyway. It's so good that you guys have a training, TEC Illinois, but and that's the website. But tell us more about the training and how people can learn more from you and where they can find you. We have a website. It's called TECIllinois.com. On the website, you can reach out for um, healing prayer and, and also training. So we have three options for a training. The first option is you can attend our live Zoom calls every Thursday, 7.30 Central Standard Time. And, and then the next option is you can request live training. So we will attend, we will travel to you if it's five people or for local. For local. If it's five people, we'll we'll travel within the state of Illinois to teach you and your people. Um, if it's overseas. Uh, or out of state, we need at least, what, 20 to mm -hmm. 25 people. Yeah. We don't charge for any of this. We don't take love offerings. We don't do any of that. We take no money from nobody because God takes <laughs> care of us. So we're calling God out on that. And not that there's anything wrong with taking donations, but um, God put it in my spirit to not take donations, do not take anything. We are not a 5013C. We just do this with our hearts. It's pure. There's no, we don't want anything from anybody. We are here to serve the Lord. That, that's why we got married. It was for the Elijah challenge. The third is you can train on your own. So all of this is listed on the website. You can, and it's different languages as well. There's videos. So, and it's all free again. All of this is free. There's no charge for anything. And so you can train at your own pace. And then also you can contact us if you have questions, if you want to schedule a training, if you need prayer, um, you can reach out to us and we will get back with you. Let me add on that. <clears throat> Our goal is to train the trainer. So if there's someone that has a prayer ministry and they're just not hitting the mark, what they can do is train with us you know, and we say it takes at least three times through the course. By that third time, you've got it and you can start training. Now, let's suppose you want to start training. We can be right there with you, helping you in all of the materials that you need for training, all of the slides, everything, the books are online and it's all free. So you can download the scripts, you can download the book, you can download the PowerPoints and make them your own. And then you teach. Our goal, <clears throat> there's millions or billions of people that need to learn about Jesus. So there's no way Shar and I can do it. We have to train the trainers and they train the trainers, but we're going to do it right this time. We're not going to do it like, you know, Charlemagne and some of the others have done and turned it backwards. We're going to do it just like Jesus did. We're going to teach you like Jesus did. 
and you're going to go for it. You're going to stick to the, the the scriptures and not to, you know, the other stuff, and it'll be successful. And when you see somebody on the street passing out or they fall out, whatever, you know what to do. Remember your training. Yes. You, you go up there. Paul or Peter looked for situations. I look for the people to get healed. I'm looking for somebody to pass out in front of me. I'm waiting for it. It hasn't happened yet. It happened one time at the gate <laughs> ring and the lady broke her wrist or something. And I did come up to her and uh, rebuke for her. But yes, you look for opportunities to heal the sick. You look for opportunities to cast out demons. You look for opportunities to raise the dead. And so you will be equipped and you will be able to hear from God yourself. It's not a feeling. We all have a power and authority and you just use it and you remember your training. So if you train, you have several options to train. If you really want to learn how to heal the sick and be a disciple, you got the website and you know what to do. You have no excuse. And God is going to remember that you looked at this video. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And we're going to have all the description at the bottom as usual. If you want to join Teddy and Shar's training, you can do that. Again, it'll be listed below. Teddy and Shar, I feel as if your zeal, your walk with the Lord and your action is building people's faith right now to enable them, to help enable them to do what you're doing which is biblical and which is the great commission. So could you do me a favor? Could you please pray for those who need healing in their body anywhere right now, even if it's mental, if it's physical, even if it's financial, if you can just pray for them for that and also pray for those who are seeking uh, not religion, but that relationship with Jesus Christ, because a lot of people are searching just like you were, Teddy, you were searching. A lot of people want that. They want the real thing. So two things, could you pray for healing? And could you pray for those who want a relationship with the one true God? In the name of Jesus, I rebuke all pain. I rebuke arthritis, heart issues. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I command all pain to stop right now in Jesus name. All inflammation, go now in Jesus' name. All cancer, go now in Jesus' name. All migraines, go now and do not return in the name of Jesus. I rebuke all unclean spirits in the individual and I command every unclean spirit to leave now in Jesus' name. I rebuke the spirit of depression, come out right now in the name of Jesus. I rebuke the spirit of suicide, go now in the name of Jesus. I command peace to be in the person right now in Jesus name, body be completely whole, all pain, infirmities, pain, issues go now in Jesus name, right? That is the rebuke. And then we'll pray. Lord, we're asking you to look upon each and every person that's listening today. We're asking you to open their hearts, open that door, give them the rhema that they need, that they will understand your word when it opens their heart. When you prick that heart, Lord, we're asking you that they harden not their heart, but they accept your word. They allow it in and they begin to believe and begin to follow you. Lord, we're asking that they just start to believe the scriptures that they read so that they will understand that, yes, it is you in the Bible. It is your word. You are the word. We need you, Lord. And I'm asking you to bless any and all people that look toward you, that want to do more for you, that want the eternal rewards that you have promised, Lord, we're asking you to open their hearts, open their minds, open their Bibles, that they will accept the words and live according to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shar and Teddy, thank you so much for sharing your testimony, for building up the church, for building the faith in people, and for showing people that they don't have to be sick, that they don't have to be down, that Jesus is the only God who thought they were dying for and actually did and is now still alive healing people and it can be done through us. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. I wanted to mention, I'm sorry. I just wanted to mention something. Um, we um, will be going to Canada um, next month. And so different um, places that we go to heal, train, we will post on our website as well. So that the people can, if they, if they're in that area, that for an example, I might be going to France um, next month. I will be posting um, where I'll be 
uh, it'll be strictly minister and healing. I don't, I'm not going to train um, just healing. And so uh, the information will be on our website. 